We are wrestling. That was the moment that many laid the blame for the eventual death of WCW2. David Arquette, the star of films such as Scream and Muppets from Space, won the World Heavyweight Championship on an April 2000 edition of WCW Thunder. To this day, it is still considered one of the lowest points in the history of professional wrestling one of the most infamous days in WCW's downward spiral. When trying to pinpoint the downfall of WCW, you can't blame a single event as tempting as it is to do so. So many bad decisions were made by so many people over the course of the last few years of the promotion, all of which contributed towards WCW's sinking. No doubt all of those people that made all of those decisions had the best of intentions in mind at the time. Wrestling fans don't just turn off their favourite promotion en masse after one incident. Many wrong decisions made during 1999 and 2000 chipped away at the fan base over time. Each fan finding their last straw, whether it was the finger poke of doom, the 50th iteration of the NWO being formed, turning DDP heel, or indeed David Arquette pinning Eric Bischoff in the middle of the ring to win the sport's greatest prize. The blame can't be landed solely in the lap of Arquette either. He, just like us, is a fan of wrestling. And who of us would have turned down the opportunity to be World Heavyweight Champion? This was Eric Bischoff's return to the promotion after being sent home a few months before. Vince Russo had been hired to replace him, and in what must have been a delicious moment of vindication for Bischoff, it quickly became obvious that Russo was not the genius he purported to be and was booking WCW into oblivion each week. So they rehired Bischoff in order to rein in the booking process. Bischoff was instrumental in the production of the WCW affiliated movie Ready to Rumble, a movie that came about due to the recent merger between Turner and Warner Brothers. Now, WCW was under the Warner Brothers umbrella, and it seemed like a no-brainer to capitalise on the late 90s and early 2000s wrestling boom with a mainstream movie, even though WCW was becoming a distant number two in the industry. What could go wrong? The screenwriters had full access to legitimate superstars of wrestling, including Goldberg, DDP, Sting and Randy Savage, Surely, they could produce a compelling story that appealed to the masses of wrestling fans at the time, and non-fans alike. Ready to Rumble, starring David Arquette, was released on April the 7th, 2000, and immediately bombed. Made with a budget of $24 million, it drew just $12.5 million at the box office. The movie immediately alienated wrestling fans by presenting them as absolute idiots, and offered precisely nothing to casual moviegoers. One critic summed the film up by saying it's humour at its lowest that isn't funny for kids and is insulting to adults. Rotten Tomatoes rates the movie at 23% over 70 reviews. The movie itself was another event that contributed to WCW's downfall and is best long forgotten. Most wrestling fans can forget the film itself as it isn't really part of the lineage of the business. Arquette winning the title is a different story. In every list of former World Heavyweight Champions, his name appears, and it always will. In an interview, Arquette said, I went to promote Ready to Rumble and WCW had me do something where I jumped into the ring and got slammed. It got a big pop and people were excited about it. I went into Nitro and they said, if you stick around, you know, we'll give you the strap. Are you f***ing kidding me? We assume that Arquette is talking about Russo making the suggestion here, but in the interim since the decision was made to make him champion, the blame has been passed between Russo and Bischoff and other backstage staff in WCW, with nobody actually wanting to admit that they came up with the idea. Certainly, nobody was suggesting that it was Tony Schiavone that was making the call, and yet on an episode of his podcast, Tony, of all people, 
admitted to making the booking suggestion to Vince Russo. Later, Vince Russo confirmed that this was the case. Tony Schiavone came up to me and you can verify this with Tony, but he goes, Vince, I want to pitch you something. Now, I'm a huge Tony Schiavone mark, who is a great guy. Tony is the guy. He looked at me and said, what if David Arquette won the WCW title? Now, you know me and my reputation. When he said that to me, I stopped dead in my tracks because here is the Swerve King. And that thought never even crossed my mind. Arquette recalled that when DDP informed him that he was going to win the belt, he thought it was a joke. The decision was justified to him by the fact that he would end up pinning Bischoff rather than an actual wrestler in a tag team match pitting him and DDP against Bischoff and Jarrett. Even so, Arquette says he was in two minds about the situation as on one hand he was a lifelong wrestling fan and what fan wouldn't relish the opportunity to hold the big gold belt even if it was just for a week. He said, The fans didn't react the way I sort of thought they would. In my head I thought, I'm the first fan that had become a champion. As a kid I was always like, oh I'd love to be that. So that's how I looked at it when it was presented to me. I thought the fans would be with me in we're all champions together, but then it wasn't and it was really the other side, and then backstage too. As Arquette states, it wasn't just the fans who were deeply annoyed by him winning the prize, so many wrestlers had been held back over the preceding decade at the hands of certain veterans playing politics and due to Eric Bischoff's short-sightedness at building new talent. Having this play out would naturally piss those guys off. Luckily, Ric Flair was not one of them, having had his fair share of main events and title wins in WCW despite being at least a decade past his prime. Ric Flair at one point put his arms around me and said, Hey guys, he's one of us. That made me feel really great. It must have been pretty easy for Slick Rick to move past the situation being in his boots, but let's not forget all of those young guys who never made it to the main events and ended up treading water for years in WCW. Arquette certainly felt like a winner at the time, living out his dream. He said that life is about experiences and the opportunity allowed him to travel with guys like Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair, which was a big deal for him. He was living his life amongst his heroes. However, it would be a short-lived rush. Arquette dropped the belt back to Jarrett on pay-per-view a few days later and was never seen in WCW again. It wouldn't be long before WWE purchased WCW, putting a full stop to all of the madness once and for all. But for Arquette, he was still a wrestling fan, and the angle would repeatedly come back to haunt him, as it was becoming evident how personally the fans took the angle. Back then people were mad at me, that's where it started, where I wanted to prove myself. Then I would go through years of watching wrestling and getting mad about everything. I would go to an event and have somebody be rude. I would say, I'm never watching wrestling again. And then I'd tune back in. Arquette was constantly torn in his years after appearing in WCW. He just wanted to enjoy wrestling like the rest of us as a fan, but nobody would let him forget his past. When I had the stents put in my heart, I told my wife I'd been thinking of wrestling. It was one of those major things I was thinking about as I was going into surgery and coming out of it. I was thinking about my family, my highlights and some of the bad things that have happened in my life. I was thinking, I wish the wrestling thing had been different. This was all clearly very hurtful for Arquette. For the full story of his attempt at wrestling redemption, I highly recommend the documentary You Cannot Kill David Arquette, which covers the whole story. If you think negatively upon Arquette for his title reign, this film might just change your mind. As an actor, just following orders and a fan of the business, you can't blame Arquette for getting caught up in the whole debacle. You can blame the likes of Bischoff, however, who should have known better. Are you ready?